don't merely watch them, I monitor them. This show, uh, Sally, Jesse, Raphael, Oprah, Winfrey, Geraldo Rivera, these kinds of shows, you can find out the thinking of the American people. And you ought to watch it and listen to it to see the thinking of the average citizen. And brothers and sisters, I saw a show that I, I never forget. It taught me some lessons. I learned for the first time in my life about two weeks ago of a disease. It's called, and I never quite understood Michael Jackson. No, until I saw the show. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Brothers and sisters, there's a real sickness. It's called imagined ugliness disorder. No, I'm not making it up, man. It's true. This sickness, I don't care how good people look, in their mind, they believe that they're ugly. Everything they can to change their look because they don't like their look. And just two days ago, we learned from Michael Jackson that when he was a boy, he believed himself to be ugly. He said, my father told me that I was ugly. And so Michael Jackson began to try to change himself. And the irony, brothers and sisters, the real irony, if you know anything about Michael Jackson when he was young, he was actually a very handsome man. And throughout the years, as he began to change his hair and the color and the nose and the lips and the chin and the voice, all of that, as he began to change that, in reality, he became ugly. Imagine ugliness disorder. Brothers and sisters, I've come to learn, Imam, I've come to understand that Muslims, by and large, suffer from an imagined ugliness disorder. Been blessed like Imam Abdul Hakim, quick to go around the world to see the conditions of the Muslims firsthand. And brothers and sisters, let me say, in my opinion, there's one basic ingredient that's missing from the Muslim Ummah in this country and in America and in the East and in Africa. This one ingredient that I found that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had and his companions had and the great prophets that came before us had and there is one thing that we miss in my opinion if we can grab hold of that we are well on our way to solving the major problems that confront the Muslims around the world that the thing the ingredient that we miss so badly parts of Toronto, parts of Canada, in America around the Muslim world is confidence you'd be surprised the value of having confidence in oneself and when you lose the confidence in yourself you've lost the war Imam mentioned it in his talk psychological warfare brothers and sisters you have no idea before we meet on the battlefield there's already a psychological war going on once you deprive a person of that vital self-confidence when they get on the battlefield they've lost brothers and sisters let me share something with you I was part of the struggle of, of African Americans in the 60s. And I see some similarities now happening to the Muslim Ummah that happened to the African Americans. We went through a period that all of us, most of us had this imagined ugliness disorder. We didn't like ourselves. We were taught by the slave master that we were nothing. 
And we didn't even know ourselves. We didn't know our language. We didn't know our culture. We didn't know our religion. And black people all over America, many people like Michael Jackson tried to change their color, tried to change the texture of their hair. Because we had believed that we were nothing. Now, brothers and sisters, something is happening to us. Siraj Wahaj. I wasn't born with that name. I admire Imam Abdel Hakim quick. He kept the name of his father and his grandfather and his son quick. And by and large, brothers and sisters, I think Muslims from the West in general ought not change their names. Because Allah revealed in Quran, لِأَبَائِهِمْ And called them by the names of their fathers. There was a big controversy that happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, the first lady of the United States of America, the wife of uh, President Clinton, her name is Hillary. Rodham Clinton and there was a controversy because during the a campaign she just used the name of her husband because the American tradition and the Canadian tradition is when a woman marries a man then she takes on his name but that's not the Islamic way and so there was a big controversy because she decided to call herself by her maiden name and she didn't get rid of her husband's name but she called herself Hillary Rodham Clinton and so the women and the American men, they didn't like that idea that she would try to keep the name of her maiden name, really the name of her father. So Imam Abdullah Hakim converted to Islam or reverted to Islam and kept the name of his father. That's right. Then why Brother Siraj Wahaj doesn't have the name of his father? Because my father's name was Kirs, and most people pronounced it curse. The name of my father, brothers and sisters, wasn't the name of my great-great-grandfather. I didn't know the name of my great-great-grandfather. When they were taken from Africa and brought here to America, then the slave master would put their name on the black slaves and they would be known by the names of their slave master. And so when I got rid of the name Curse or Kears, I was getting a rid of the slave master name and also at the same time taking on a good name from the Quran and leaving what was a bad name according to the tradition of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But brothers and sisters, now something else is happening, something strange is happening. Something is missing, what is it? And brothers and sisters, look at this. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Abu Huraira radiallahu an said, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, took me by the hands and said, Allah created the earth on Saturday and created the mountains on Sunday and created the trees on Monday and created disagreeable things on Tuesday and created the light on Wednesday and spread the animals on the earth on Thursday and made his man Adam on Friday, the later part of the day. What wisdom there is for us. Allah created man last. He's the last one. Johnny come lately on the earth. Everything is here already. The earth is here. The home is here. The food is here. The trees are here. Everything that man needs is here already. And when man comes, all he has to do now is go get what Allah the Almighty has given to him. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm coming to my conclusion. What does all this mean? What does it mean, dear Muslim brothers and sisters? What does it mean? I don't mean to slight our non-Muslim brothers and sisters who are sitting here to visit us. But I'm saying this without hesitation. The only hope for the world are Muslims and Islam. There is no hope for the world except the obedience of Allah that is found in Al-Quran and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. 
I don't care what it looks like. Because brothers and sisters, when you look around the earth, and when you see what's happening to the Muslim Ummah, it's for a reason. There's something missing. And you know what it was? I spoke to Imam Abdul Hakim this morning at Fajr. And he gave me the answer. He whispered something in my ear from the Quran and I said, yeah, that is the answer. And you know what it is, brothers and sisters? If you live long enough, according to the Quran, you're going to have a reversal in your nature. What do I mean? When I look around at this audience, most of you are young. Most of you are young. Most of you are on the way to your full strength. I heard a little baby crying. I see little children over there in the other room and uh, young adolescents. But you know what? As strong as you are now, young brothers and sisters, if you live long enough, you're going to have a reversal in your nature. You're going to start getting weak. So after having known much, you may even become Hafiz of Quran, but if you live long enough, you're going to start forgetting things. And your back, brother, is going to bend over. If you live long enough, you're going to lose your teeth. If you live long enough, you may even have to wear pampers. That's the way it is. Allah, Allah made it that way. You can't escape it. And I don't care, brothers and sisters, what kind of science, not technology, but still you cannot escape what Allah says in the Quran. وَمَا كَانَ لِنَفْسٍ أَنْ تَمُوتَ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ لَا كِتَابٍ مُؤَجِّلًا No soul can die except by the permission of Allah. It's in a book inscribed already. It's in a book written. So we're going to die. We're going to get old. If we live long enough, we're going to live old and we're going to have a, a reversal in nature. You can't escape that. But... There is something that you can't escape. And Allah promised us. Imam said in his speech, he talked about the glorious days of Islam. But what happened? There are some who tell you that civilizations, they live and they die. But some say that civilizations must die like human beings. That's not true. What is my evidence? The evidence is what the Imam told me this morning, Fajr prayer. He says, Inna Allah, Inna Allah la yugayiru ma bi qawmin hatta yugayiru ma bi anfusihim. Listen well. Allah will never change the condition of a people until they first change what is within themselves. Most of us don't understand that ayat from the Quran. Most of us, we look at it from the reversal. That if we're in a negative position and condition, Allah won't change it to something positive until we do something positive. Yes, that's true. But there's a greater message there. A more fundamental message. And that is this. Brothers and sisters, if you're in a good condition, if the Ummah is submissive to Allah the Almighty and doing what they're supposed to do, we will continue to get the ni'mah of Allah. Continue to give it to us until we change. How many times have I seen a, a Muslim come to me and say, Brother Imam Siraj, I, I, I don't make prayer, but I, I believe. Month of Ramadan is coming in a few days. You're going to fast month of Ramadan? No, no, Imam, but don't judge me. Okay, you can't judge my heart. I, I believe, but I'm not going to fast. Have you ever been to Hajj, brother? No, I, I, I haven't been to Mecca yet. I, I've been to Europe. I've been to Africa. I've been to India. I've been all over the earth. I have the money, but I don't want to go to Hajj yet. Huh? I, but I believe. Oh, brother. How can you justify living with this woman and you're not married to her? You can't judge me, ma'am. I'm a believer. How can you justify having a liquor store selling liquor? How can you justify selling beer? Oh, oh no, you don't, you don't understand. Everything is real. I'm a believer. But 
But you cannot continue to disrespect Allah, disobey Allah, and then put your hands out and ask for the blessings of Allah. Ya Rab, Ya Rab. The Prophet said, and yet the food is haram, their clothing is haram, they're nourished with haram things, their drink is haram. How then can Allah hear their dua? Don't you see, brothers and sisters, there's a promise in Quran. If we continue to obey Allah, Allah will continue to give us blessings. He won't take it away from us unless we ourselves turn our backs on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm saying to you, my beloved brothers and sisters, we have turned our backs on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what we see here is as a result of what our hands have done. Look at this. Look how Allah starts us out. وَقُلْنَا يَا آدَمُ اسْكُنْ أَنْتَ وَزَوْجُكَ الْجَنَّةَ وَقُلَا مِنْهَا رَغَدًا حَيْثُ شِئْتُمَا وَلَا تَقْرَبَا هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةَ فَتَكُونَا مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ And we said, O oh Adam, live in the garden. The garden, live there, Adam. Live there, you and your wife and eat from the garden anywhere you desire. Go ahead, Adam. Big, spacious Jannah, the garden. Go ahead, eat everywhere, anywhere you want. Beautiful place. But just don't go near this tree. You too. Don't go near that tree and become of the volume, the evil ones. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask you a question before I sit down. If you think you were in that garden, you, brother, and your wife, and by, the, and by the way, that verse teaches us that Allah created Adam and Eve and not Adam and Steve. If you were in that garden, brother and you, sister, garden now, imagine anywhere you want. And if Allah told you, don't go near that tree, but you can have everything else in the garden, how many, think, how many of you think you would have resisted and not gone near the tree? Be honest, raise your hand. If you don't think that you've gone there, you would go near the tree, raise your hand. Raise them up, come on, raise them up. Five, six, seven, eight. All right, a handful of people. Imam, your hand up. Yeah, you know. <laughs> well, 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 wait. We can we can find out, hey, man. We can we can test it. We can find out. The same Allah who said don't approach that tree is the same Allah saying don't go near Zinah. Don't eat rabah. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't cheat. Be honest. Tell the truth. The question is, do we obey all the laws of Allah now? Oh, there's a few more now. Yes, before, just don't go near the tree. But now, there's a few more. So, brothers and sisters, I say this to you. Let me be honest with you. Let me be honest. If the Muslims continue to suffer around the earth, I'm still, inshallah, going to believe in this book 100%. And no matter what happens, I have always made a pledge to myself that if it ever happens, anywhere on this earth, I feel it. I feel so confident in this Islam. I feel so confident that if every Muslim on this earth would die except one, I believe that that Muslim would multiply himself or herself and go out there with the message of La ilaha illallah and start all over again 
and populate the earth all over again. I feel so confident that if there was only one, just one, that Muslim would migrate to Mecca and they would uphold the Kaaba and they would talk to somebody and try to convince them that Islam is right. But there's nobody else, no other Muslims. You're the only one left, so what? And you know what gives me the confidence? Something that the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I'm finished. I'm almost finished. I've said it, I repeat it myself, and I'll say it again because to me it represents what we're talking about tonight, brothers and sisters. We need a shot of confidence. A man came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, uh, My brother's stomach is ailing. The Prophet said, Give him honey. It didn't work. The Prophet said, Give him honey. It didn't work the second time. Give him honey. It didn't work the third time. And when the Prophet said, I swear by Allah, the stomach of your brother lies. And Allah speaks the truth. Give him honey. He gave him honey. And the man was cured. The lesson there, brothers and sisters, is that our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had the confidence in the words of Allah the Almighty that honey is a shifa, honey is a healing. So now I close with this profound hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look, look, the birds go out, their stomachs are empty, and they come back and their bellies are full. What is the lesson? The birds didn't sit home. They trusted Allah. But that trust doesn't make them, that trust doesn't make them sit down. No, the trust make them go out and to look. And brothers and sisters, I say this to you, Imam Abdullah Akin, it is my opinion, Imam, that the Muslims around the world, from my experience, from my travels, are looking to the Muslims in the United States and Canada, waiting for us to see what we're going to do. Imam, I don't think we should wait anymore. I think right now, the only thing that's missing is real confidence in ourselves. And how do we get it? We get it, one, to realize, brothers and sisters, that it's not me. It's not us. It's the one who stands behind us, in front of us. It's Allah, the Almighty. And when we know who Allah is, make our young children know who Allah is. I'm saying these young children with the responsibility of these mothers. Mothers, you want to do something? Instill in those babies the knowledge of Allah. Make them know Allah. Make them little girls and make them little boys. Make them know Allah. If they know nothing else, make them know Allah. Number two, let them know the greatness of our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If our young children can sing the latest rap, you'd be surprised. Ask them. So, so uh, Ahmed, what's the latest rap? Can can you sing it? You'd be surprised. Let them know Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And three, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters. You got to have confidence in your leadership. And your leadership have got to have centralized leadership. I'm saying it every time I come to Toronto, I'll say it again. You got to work together. The leadership got to work together because when the people don't see the leadership working together, they start losing confidence. They don't feel that we're going to get it together. We stop, we start doing things. We 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 waste resources. Confidence in leadership. I have confidence in your leadership. I'm not only talking about Imam Adel Hakim, all of the Imams. 
I love them and I will continue, continue to help any way we can to work together. If the imams can work together, then the people will have more confidence. When the people have more confidence, they can go in their pockets and they can give more money. The imam can say, listen, I need $25,000 tonight. And someone can say, yes, here's $25,000. And the last one, confidence in yourself. You know what I know, brothers and sisters? You talk to an audience of 400, 500 people, you may not move everybody. Some people won't be moved, they won't uh, budge. They'll be the same way. Some can listen to talk after talk, speech after speech. Don't make them a difference. They'll come to the, a place that sit down like a tomato and go out the same way. Allah knows best. But, maybe, in this audience, there's one, or two, or few, a bunch. It'll make a difference. It'll be a word, a, a sentence, something, that's said, and all of a sudden now, they have a different idea. And brothers and sisters, you want me to tell you what gives you confidence? Real confidence? Words begin confidence. But let me tell you what really gives you confidence. It's practice. It's getting out on the field. You know, brothers and sisters, years ago, I used to be one of the shyest people I knew. I was afraid to talk to people. I told somebody the other day, when I was going to uh, high school, the teacher used to make us read in public. I used to be afraid. And whenever the teacher said, we're going to have public reading, you know what I used to do? I used to sink down in my chair. Like, don't, don't call on me. And I used to, sh I'm telling you the truth, I used to shake. I didn't like to read. But when I became a Muslim, brothers and sisters, oh, I used to love to read. offered by our guest chaplain, Imam Siraj Wazaj, member of the American Muslim Council, Washington, D.C. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, praise belong to thee alone, O God, Lord and church of all the worlds. Praise belong to thee, who shaped us and colored us in the wombs of our mothers, colored us black and white, brown, red and yellow. Praise belong to thee, who created us from males and females and made us into nations and tribes that we may know one another. Most gracious, most merciful, all-knowing, all-wise, just God, master of the day of judgment, thee alone do we worship, and from thee alone do we seek help. Guide the leaders of this nation who have been given a great responsibility in worldly affairs. Guide them and grant them righteousness and wisdom guide them and us on the straight path the path of those whom thou hast bestowed thy favors the path of your inspired servants the path of noah abraham moses jesus and muhammad guide them and us not on the path of the disobedient ones who have earned your wrath and displeasure i mean Mr. Speaker, it is an honor for me to welcome to the House Chamber as guest chaplain today the Imam of Rashid al-Taqwa, Siraj Wahaj of Brooklyn, New York. He is the first Muslim leader to work in cooperation with the New York City Police Department, and he is nationally known for his leadership in establishing a drug-free zone in the drug-laden neighborhood, his neighborhood of Bedford-Stuyvesant in New York. Siraj Wahaj works well within the community in which he was born and where he has lived for 41 years. Siraj Wahaj's leadership extends far beyond his local community. In addition to being a member of the Rashid al-Shara, the consultative committee of New York City, he serves on the advisory board of the Islamic Society of North America and is a member of the board of directors of the American Muslim Council in Washington, D.C. Siraj Wahaj was one of the first Muslims to address Christians from the pulpit. His weekly radio program on WWRLAM is popular with non-Muslims as well as with Muslims. As he prayed for the members of this body today and the people we represent, I know his words entered the minds and will remain in the hearts of all those within the sound of his voice and the reading of his words. Don't call on me. And I used to, sh I'm telling you the truth, I used to shake. I didn't like to read.
when I became a Muslim, brothers and sisters, oh, I used to love to read. But I learned the valuable lesson that if you want confidence, you can't talk a good game. You got to get out there. And I remember, brothers and sisters, I had to sell some newspapers. And you know what? I was scared to death. I was out there by myself. The first day I went to sell newspaper, it was an a, a Islamic period, periodical. And I would go out there, and brothers and sisters, people come, what is it that you want? And I would say, Could you, you don't want to buy one of these, do you? But you know what? The more I was out there, the more I talked to the people, the more confident I became, the bolder I became. And before you knew it, I was out there talking to the people. And now, Allah blessed me some time to talk to 500, 1,000 people, 7,000 people, 10,000 people. There's no fear. Why? Not in me, but in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the idea, Imam, we got to get them out on the field. We got to get these brothers, and we got to get out in the field. We got to knock on doors. We got to talk to the Canadians. We got to talk to the government. Not only the Imam Abdul Hakim quick, but all of us. We got to talk to the Canadian people and say, look, we got a way out. Islam is the way. Islam is the only way. Come, but don't believe what I say. Watch what I do. And if we do that, brothers and sisters, we will get the confidence. And the people will have instilled in them the confidence of the Muslim leadership. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. Raise money for Isra tonight, inshallah. And I will donate as I always donate, inshallah. Whatever Allah has blessed me with, I go to give it to our, my brother, Imam, and this service orientation or this service association or organization. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the Imam, bless the Imams, all of them in the city, bless the Muslim organizations, all of them. I make dua, all of them for success, and let us come together for the pleasure of Allah. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum.